Welcome to this webinar on nine ways to look after your brain as you age. I'm Dr. Celia Harris, and I'm here with a group of researchers from the Age Lab at Western Sydney University. We're a group of psychologists and cognitive scientists who do research on the way that cognition, your thinking and remembering and decision making, as well as your mental health can change across the lifespan and what we can do to best support people as they get older. The webinar that we're going to introduce today is based on um, some many decades of research on the way that your the behaviours that you engage in throughout your life can impact your risk of developing dementia in later life. You might have seen some news reports on this just in the last few weeks, where a new paper released in the Lancet journal uh, showed that lifestyle changes or modifiable risk factors account for about 40% of dementia cases. Um, there's a headline there that comes from The Guardian. And really what this model on the right shows is that different behaviours that you engage in throughout your life, things that you can change, things that you can do differently, make up about 40% of your risk of developing dementia in later life. I'll just zoom in a little bit um, on that model so you can see what the factors are. These are the factors that contribute to your dementia risk um, that come from midlife. Um, so particularly hearing loss is an important one there, up to 8% of your dementia risk. And some of the things that you're doing in later life, um, health behaviours like smoking or, and physical activity, as well as mental health like depression and social isolation are contributing to your um, brain health. So we're going to talk through uh, the evidence behind some of these factors in some detail today. And particularly, we want to focus on some um, tips or suggestions about ways that you can uh, implement this knowledge about these risk factors to make good changes in your life for brain health. The first recommendation coming out of this research is to get your hearing tested and treated if necessary. So we know that hearing loss is a common experience as people get older. Um, once you're into your 60s, over half of um, adults report at least some level of hearing loss. And that increases as you get further on in life as well. But also hearing loss is a risk factor for developing dementia. So even with mild hearing loss, people are twice as likely to develop dementia. And those with severe hearing loss are five times as likely. And as we saw in the model presented earlier, we uh, can see that um, midlife hearing loss accounts for 8% of dementia risk. It's actually one of the biggest modifiable risk factors. So why is this? Well, the science is not settled. We don't know exactly why there's this close link between hearing and your brain health. But one hypothesis is that if you experience hearing loss, it causes you to withdraw from other kinds of enriching activities that you might engage in. It causes you to be less social and it causes you to get less stimulation and less input to your brain. So you do less when you're having trouble hearing. There's other possibilities too. So one hypothesis is known as the common cause hypothesis. And that suggests that it could be that there's a common cause underlying both um, neural um, difficulties, um, reductions in cognition and hearing loss. So it could be that pathology in your brain is responsible for both changes in your cognitive function and changes to your hearing. And the jury is still out. We don't exactly know what the mechanism is. But importantly, hearing loss is classified as a modifiable risk factor. What does modifiable mean? It means that you can do something about it. So on average, people take seven years from first noticing that they're having some trouble hearing to actually getting hearing treatment. So that's assessment by an audiologist and perhaps hearing aids or an implant. So this delay of seven years is a real missed opportunity in terms of protecting your cognitive health because there's growing evidence that treating your hearing can improve your cognition. So for instance, some studies show that people with treated hearing loss, people who are wearing a hearing aid, do not show the same cognitive decline as those with untreated hearing loss. So that is, it might not be hearing loss per se that is a risk factor, but it's untreated hearing loss that is a risk factor. And that means you can do something about it. So get your hearing tested, talk to your GP if you're worried or see an audiologist, and if you need it, get treatment. Don't wait seven years. Thanks, Celia. 
My name is Mark, and I'm going to talk to you about why it's so important to keep learning across the lifespan. While cognitive decline becomes more prevalent as we age, what's interesting is that we see differences across people in terms of how soon they experience cognitive difficulties. Some people, despite showing the physical signs of dementia in brain scans, are able to maintain a healthy and age-typical cognitive status. They don't show the symptoms we would expect, such as forgetting. How is this possible? What makes some brains more resilient than others? Many studies conducted on animal models have shown that interacting with a complex environment creates new brain cells and connections. This in turn promotes cognitive abilities and the capacity to compensate for injury. This offers an explanation for the individual differences we see across people. It is called cognitive reserve, and it is the brain's ability to resist or compensate for gradual age-related damage. Cognitive reserve is thought to be the result of changes that are a consequence of a physically and mentally stimulating lifestyle, such as having an education, an interesting occupation, or taking part in leisure activities. This raises the question of whether engaging in cognitively stimulating activities in older adulthood can also benefit the brain. To cut a long story short, the answer is yes, it can. Cognitive improvements brought about by learning are attributed to brain plasticity which is the brain's ability to change based on experience and learning. Changes have been observed in the brain following relatively short-term training interventions. And importantly, training-related changes are not restricted to young people. They occur even when training occurs in later life. Learning can bring about positive brain and cognitive outcomes due to plasticity effects, even in older adulthood. We never lose the ability to learn. Many different types of learning activities have been studied. These include completing crossword puzzles, completing math exercises, and doing things like Sudoku, doing brain training exercises, taking part in computer-based interventions, even just learning how to use a computer can be helpful. Learning a foreign language. Learning a new hobby like quilting. Learning to play a musical instrument like the piano. Picking up a new hobby like learning how to take photographs and use a digital camera. And what's more, these benefits have been shown to persist over time. So it seems that the old saying, use it, or lose it is true when applied to keeping your brain healthy. Encouragingly, those older adults who are at risk of dementia, and even those who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, have shown positive responses to various forms of training and learning. So it really is never too late to start learning. So, Start learning something new today. So you may have heard the slogan, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And smoking is definitely not good for either. The cortex thins, thins with normal ageing and this is exacerbated by smoking. Um, and this cortical thinning is a biomarker of cognitive decline such that smokers on average have much poorer cognitive functioning, global cognitive functioning as they age, particularly in areas of cognitive flexibility, so fluid intelligence and in memory. So longitudinal studies and meta-analysis of the effects of smoking on brain health have shown that uh, there's a substantial increased risk of dementia amongst smokers, and it can take about 25 years for the complete cortical recovery um, for the average smoker. And this, this affects dose dependent. So the more you smoke, the longer it takes for your brain to recover after smoking. 
Smoking also nearly doubles the risk of ischemic stroke. That is stroke which results from a blockage of the um, blood vessels in your brain such that the brain tissue dies off as a function of the loss of blood flow to parts of the brain. Um, uh, smoking also uh, increases the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, that is a stroke where you get bleeding into the brain tissue. Um, so stopping smoking reduces, substantially reduces your risk of stroke but it's unclear whether it returns the, back to the level of the non-smoker. So in terms of brain health, you're much better off smoke, stopping smoking if you're a smoker, but never starting smoking in the first place. Seeking treatment for depression and anxiety is actually one way that we can keep our mind healthy and mitigate the risks of developing dementia. Now, depression and anxiety are common um, mental health conditions which often co-occur. And apart from just psychological symptoms of low mood, etc., people with um, depression and anxiety can also experience cognitive difficulties such as poor memory, difficulty concentrating and focusing on things. Research shows us that cognitive aging can actually be accelerated in people who have a diagnosis of depression and anxiety. And research shows a pretty strong correlation between depression and um, a diagnosis of depression and experiences of memory problems and cognitive difficulties later in life. One of the challenges around uh, depression later in life is that the symptoms such as you know, poor memory, difficulty concentrating, difficulty getting going, are very similar to the symptoms of um, a mild cognitive impairment and even dementia. And this makes diagnosis sometimes difficult because it's un unrecognisable and untreated. And that's important because depression in later in life has actually been um, identified as a risk factor for developing dementia. And while dementia and depression are related to each other, it's probably a bi-directional relationship, which means it may be uh, not the fact that dementia's, uh, depression's causing dementia, but also that the changes in our system due to dementia is um, giving rise to symptoms of depression. What we do know from the literature is that depression, particularly when it's uh, prolonged, severe and untreated, can lead to structural changes or is associated with structural changes in our brain. Now that can be inflammation in our brain in some areas such as the prefrontal cortex. It can be um, shrinkage in other areas such as the hippocampus which is associated with memory and also enlargement of structures like the amygdala which is associated with uh, problems in sleep and also anxiety. The good news, however, is that um, late life depression has been identified as a modifiable risk factor, uh, which means um, late life depression, sorry, has been identified as a modifiable risk factor, which means that if we seek treatment and engage in preventative strategies, we not only reduce the risk for ourselves, but we can also look at reducing the incidence of dementia in the population. So what are the options for prevention and treatment? Basically, healthy lifestyle choices, such as getting plenty of exercise. Uh, research shows that as little as um, exercising moderately three times a week um, can be as effective in treating mild depression as an antidepressant. Also, good sleep, nutrition, meditation and socialising uh, helpful treatment strategies together with um, avoiding alcohol. Now, avoiding alcohol is important because uh, the Lancet recently identified that as another uh, modifiable risk factor for dementia um, because there is an association between excessive alcohol use and the onset of dementia. And this is important in the area of depression because people will often um, use alcohol or misuse alcohol as a way of trying to make themselves feel better when depressed. Other options include counselling and psychological interventions like cognitive um, behavioural therapy or CBT. 
And then of course there's antidepressant medications. The research shows um, that antidepressants are most effective when they're used in combination with the other strategies such as the CBT and also the um, changes in lifestyle. Interestingly, uh, SSRI antidepressants have been shown to delay uh, the progression of uh, mild cognitive impairment to dementia um, in people who have a diagnosis of depression. So seeking treatment is important in staying healthy and keeping our mind healthy. Here are some online resources uh, which are uh, very important in the middle of the in a pandemic because we don't actually need to go and see a person face to face. There's places like Beyond Blue, DNet, Blue Pages, Black Dog Institute, Mental Health Net, Sane Australia, and of course Lifeline, which all have um, online services available. And of course, if you or someone you know is in crisis, please ring Lifeline on one three double one one four. Hello, I'm going to talk about the benefits of exercise for maintaining a healthy brain. A recent study compared amateur cyclists who were older but had regularly exercised throughout their life with older adults who had not regularly exercised. And they found that the people who did more exercise were able to maintain muscle mass and strength limit body fat and cholesterol, and also had a younger immune system. However, fewer than 50% of over 65s do enough exercise to stay healthy. It's important to uh, regularly exercise because it protects against dementia. And the Lancet Commissions uh, recently showed that this is possibly due to reduced obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular risk. However, the good news is that it's never too late to start exercising. And the Australian government has guidelines for people over the age of 65. They recommend that you do 30 minutes of exercise per day or if you're not able to do the 30 minutes, you can start by slowly building up to 30 minutes by doing one or two minutes on the first day and increasing from there. They also recommend that the 30 minutes includes four different types of exercise. The first is moderate fitness exercise, and that includes things like walking the dog, playing tennis or golf, swimming, or even just doing the vacuuming. The second are strength activities such as weight or resistance training, taking the stairs instead of the lift, or even carrying the groceries. The third are flexibility exercises, uh, which include things like Tai Chi or bowls, um, mopping and vacuuming, yoga, gardening, or simple stretching exercises. And the fourth are balancing activities, and they include something called kettle exercises, which is why I have this picture of a kettle here. And those are exercises that you can do while waiting for the, while waiting for the kettle to boil and holding onto the kitchen bench. And if you go and Google kettle exercises, you can get some examples of uh, specific kettle activities. So another thing that you can do uh, for your brain, which is really valuable, is managing high blood pressure and high blood sugars. So individuals who develop um, diabetes or high blood pressure during middle age, so between 40 and 65, um, tend to have brain cell loss as a consequence and other kinds of minor brain damage. Um, so patients with diabetes and uh, hypertension are also more likely to have problems with memory and with thinking skills compared to those who don't have these uh, conditions. So like smoking, high blood pressure in particular uh, results in an increased risk of stroke, and this is particularly ischemic stroke. Um, and high blood sugars have the effect of reducing the brain volume. 
And so this reduction in brain volume can be up to about 3 to 4% of total brain size. And it's particularly in areas of the brain which are associated with memory, so in the hippocampus. Um, and there's also some evidence that there's a, a dose-dependent function between the level of high blood sugar and the effect that it has on brain so size as well. So particularly um, high levels of blood sugar result in particularly high levels of um, change in brain volume. However, it's, there are really effective ways to, measure, to manage both um, blood sugars and your high blood pressure. So you can do that through lifestyle interventions such as exercise and healthy eating um, and reduced stress. Um, and there are also effective medications that you can use to reduce both blood pressure and uh, blood sugar. So this is something which is a really good idea to check out with your GP. So get your doctor to assess your blood sugars and your blood pressure on a regular basis and then um, try some kind of intervention if your blood sugars or blood pressure are outside of the uh, regulation guidelines. Our seventh recommendation is that you be as socially engaged as you can. So social engagement keeps your mind healthy and there's a range of reasons for that. There's a range of ways in which social activity is good for you. Social activities provide cognitive stimulation. They're something to do. They make the environment new and interesting and different. So like the learning activities that Mark was talking about before. And social engagement also enhances your mood, reduces anxiety and depression. It makes you feel happy. And we know that um, mood is good for your mind. So there's research showing that higher social engagement and activity reduces the risk of cognitive decline and can actually be protective of your cognitive health. So people who report higher so engaging in more uh, social activities um, tend to show less cognitive decline when they're tracked over time. Particularly, it's um, social activity in late life that is predictive of cognitive health. So um, we can see that social isolation in later life in that model that we looked at at the beginning is accounting for 4% of people's dementia risk. It's quite a big one. So it's particularly important to maintain your social activity as you get older into later life. And that's when it can be harder to. Some research has focused on what's known as a social prescription. So telling people who are at risk of cognitive decline, maybe they're quite isolated. So giving them social activity as a kind of medicine, telling them to engage and sign up for community and cultural activities and examining the impact of that. And you find that a social prescription, getting people to sign up for community activities, new things, does reduce the risk of cognitive decline over time. So it doesn't have to be necessarily social activity with friends and family. It can be broader social circle than that, joining clubs. My own research has focused on the protective value of reminiscing conversations with loved ones. So um, talking about your past with your friends, family, neighbours, club members, etc., and what I've found is that remembering in conversation with others boosts your memory performance compared to remembering alone. You remember better, more richly, you remember more details when you remember in conversation with another person. There's other evidence also in a range of cognitive tasks, not just memory, showing that couples perform better when they remember together, when they work together on those range of cognitive tasks compared to alone. And even when people have dementia and are quite significantly impaired, we see evidence that their partner is able to help them to recall details from their life that they've otherwise forgotten. So partners or people who know us well are able to remind us of things that we didn't remember before. I found that the nature of the conversation really matters and the way in which you communicate with each other when you're talking about past events matters for how much you get a benefit from these conversations. So it's important to cue each other, provide reminders to each other and make space for and acknowledge each other's contributions to the conversation. What's less helpful is um, worrying about accuracy and worrying about getting all the details right, correcting each other. So when you're reminiscing about the past, it's good to avoid corrections and to really focus on making meaning, enjoying the activity, um, enjoying the building your relationship with other people rather than focusing on getting all the details exactly right. 
So finding opportunities for rich and reminiscing conversations with your family and with your friends can help to enhance your memory function. So socialising has quite significant mental health benefits. We are very social creatures as humans, and this means we need contact with people on a regular basis. So when we don't have this contact and we start feeling lonely, we start feeling alone, we start feeling low mood, we feel socially isolated. And this has been strongly linked with higher rates of depression. And this is also quite a high risk factor to suicide. We also know that men above the age of 85 are the highest rating age group for suicide. So this is quite a, a worrying and significant statistic. And this means that we need to address the issue of social isolation. So having a really good supportive social relationship network as compared to not having one is a strong predictor of healthy aging. So those with a large, strong, supportive social network are likely to age a lot healthier, report less um, disease and cognitive decline, but also better mental health. So studies have shown that um, having a close social relationships gives people a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose within their community, within their relationship, as well as within their family and social group. It does actually reduce the rate of suicide. And this also translates to online social media and socialising. So studies looking at people who use over the age of 65 who use Facebook compared to uh, older adults over the age of 65 who don't use Facebook found that the, the older adults who do use Facebook, they feel a lot more included in their social groups and very empowered. So obviously during a pandemic, meeting up with your friends and family is quite difficult um, as well as illegal in some states at the moment. So during the pandemic, ways to stay connected can include scheduling virtual visits with your friends and family. So just like you would meet up with your, your son, your daughter or your grandchildren on a Friday night or a Saturday or a Sunday morning for breakfast, um, similarly, we can do this virtually. So you can schedule in a visit at the same time as you normally would um, and you can video chat. Uh, you can do this through FaceTime, you could do this through Skype, through WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. There are many different apps that are free for use and all you will need is the internet and either a laptop device, a, a tablet or a mobile phone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Facebook users uh, are more likely to feel socially included in their friends group and family groups. And this also increases their sense of connectedness to the people around them. So that's another way um, of connecting with people and staying socially involved. You can also join an interest group. So there's a website uh, called www.meetup.com um, and you can choose online interest groups if you like. So this could be groups interested in cooking, for example, or a particular book or games. Um, and it can also be a language. So, for example, German-speaking groups or French-speaking groups. You may also choose to learn a language or learn how to dance or learn how to cook or pick up a new skill. So, some classes or courses are offered through um, schools such as the Wesley School for Seniors, and most of these are free of charge. And at the moment, they do have quite a lot of programs running fully online. You can also join an online seniors discussion group. So seniorchatters.co.uk is a free website for over 55s and it connects people globally. Um, so that's another way of joining a global uh, social group. Um, another really cute way um, of connecting with people is surprising a loved one or a friend with a handwritten letter or a card. Maintaining a healthy body weight and eating a heart healthy diet is important for maintaining brain health in an older age. Researchers have been particularly interested in the pie plant intake Mediterranean diet. One study that followed up the same people for five years 
found that those with the highest green leafy vegetable intake also had the least amount of cognitive decline. They argued that these people were equivalent to being 11 years younger cognitively. However, a separate study that followed up people for 25 years found that those who followed a Mediterranean diet were no more cognitively healthy than those who had it, except if the people had cardiovascular disease. Now this suggests that diet might influence dementia risk by, pro by protecting people from cardiovascular disease. The World Health Organization guidelines recommend a Mediterranean diet to reduce the risk of cognitive decline or dementia because it might help and it does not do any harm. More recently, studies have been looking at something called flavonoids, which are plant-derived uh, compounds that are found in fruit, vegetables, cocoa, and some beverages like tea and coffee. They've received a lot of research attention, which has shown that flavonoids might be capable of improving cerebrovascular function, which in turn improves cognitions like memory and learning. And these studies have specifically shown improvement in cognitive control and memory for around one to five hours after eating flavonoid rich foods such as blueberries. However, more research is needed to determine whether flavonoids have a longer term effect on brain function and cognition. Overall, the take home message from this is that what is healthy for the heart is also healthy for the brain. I'm gonna talk about being creative and how that can help maintain a healthy brain. So when we think about being creative, we're actually creative in a number of different domains. It's an essential cognitive process in life. But some of the examples that might come more easily to mind are examples in business innovation, so when a team are creating a new product. But we also are creative when we communicate with others and perform everyday life tasks. But with creative arts and cultural activities, a lot of these actually involve the chance to learn new skills, like Mark was talking about earlier, and they provide an avenue for more social connection that Celia and Jay were also talking about. Recent research suggests that engagement with the creative arts is actually linked to increased life satisfaction and better mental health. And that was controlling for some factors like age and socioeconomic status. But creative arts and activities actually have a number of different functions that will help with the brain. Particularly in the pandemic, um, we see that creative arts are being used for distraction. They might be used to give a sense of purpose. They can also be used to cope with negative feelings. And as I mentioned, they can often be a route to more social connection. So what are the types of things you can do to be more creative? And thinking about being creative as a way to help boost your cognitive, your emotional and your social health. So here are some things to try. You could make a photo collage. That could be with photos that are printed out or if you want to use some online tools to create an online photo book. You could try writing new lyrics to a familiar song. This is a technique known in music therapy as therapeutic songwriting. Or you could learn to play a musical instrument. Some of the studies that we've got running in the Marx Institute currently are in looking at learning to play a musical instrument in later life. You could also write a short story. That could be something from your memory, something from your past, or you could use imaginary characters and create a new story. The key is to pick something personally meaningful to you, and then also try and use that as a springboard for a discussion with a friend or a neighbor. Don't be afraid to try something new. As I said, our research has shown that it's never too late to pick up one of these skills. And finding opportunities for creating in different ways can help that sense of achievement, it be an avenue for self-expression and identity in our environments that are particularly now ever-changing.
So if you'd like to be involved in some of the studies that are running at the Marx Institute, here are some details of studies that are currently running. I've talked about our music instrument learning program. If you're aged between 65 and 80 and you haven't really learned how to play a musical instrument before, we have our Active Minds Music Ensemble. So that's a program where over 12 months you'll be given music instrument lessons. Some details on how to apply are on this screen. It's now completely online, so you can do it in the comfort of your own home. And you'll have an instrument lesson once a fortnight over the 12 months and have interviews and assessments every three months. If you want to find out more, do contact Dr. Anthony Schmuel, either at the email address or the phone number provided on the screen. If you're interested in hearing about the research that's coming out of the Age Lab, or you'd like to hear about new research opportunities as they arise, then please get in touch with us. You can join our mailing list where our email address is there, the Age Lab at Western Sydney. .edu.au. And in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed telling you about all this research and enjoy going out there and working on your brain health. <laughs>